a master plan. Okay. So a real master plan. So using a landscape architect and engineering firm to kind of go and lay out State Street. Because if we're going to be shutting down at some point the Rialto Bridge for repairs and replacement, that would be a great opportunity if we want to talk about putting in moving, moving curb lines, putting in tree boxes and planters. A lot of what you'd see for like um, what Barry did for their main street, what Waterbury did for their main street, those all involved doing streetscape plans to decide where the trees are going to be, where the bump outs are going to be for crosswalks, where the street light's going to be, where the bench is going to be. Um, you Remind know. me where the Rialto Bridge is. Which Rialto one? Bridge is Stone the bridge. bridge Stone on bridge. State, yeah, Street. State Street. The State Street Bridge. It's called Rialto. Oh, because right, the one with buildings, buildings on it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's right there over the North Branch. Okay. So it would be a good opportunity for us to connect from Taylor Street, which has a plan already and is going to be reconstructed. Um, and then we could kind of connect from Taylor Street back down to Main Street. State and Main. State and Main, yep. How does this fit in with the scoping study that's being done on Barry and Main? I think we would want to go and integrate the findings of that. So if we end up with a street light, so there's a scoping study that's looking at Barry and Main. Whatever they do to Barry and Main, they're going to probably have to do at the other intersections. So if you choose a roundabout, you'd probably need a roundabout from State and Main, and you'd probably need a roundabout for School Street. If you go with lights, you'd probably need a light, a light, a light, and they would have to all be timed. And so that's the initial, some of the initial findings that, from what my understanding was, that's probably what they'd have to do. That's why they really can't look at one just in isolation. Sure. They have to look at, in fact, all the way out to Route 2, all the way through, although Route 2 could never be a roundabout, so that's always going to be a light. But the other ones would probably fit into, into multiple things, but you can't do a roundabout with a light on either end because it would jam up oh. the roundabout. Mm. Oh, right. It kind of makes the roundabout. Mm. Yeah, once, once the red light stops, it would pickle the roundabout. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so you kind of have to keep roundabouts all the way through to make the roundabout idea work. So is, is that what they're going to talk about on Wednesday? That's a Tom question. I don't okay. know specifically right. what. Just I, so everybody Yeah, knows. I haven't been in the loop there on. There is a, a scoping study presentation on Wednesday. Are they, so are they giving the results of the scoping study? Well, they're asking for public comment. Okay, I haven't, I haven't done my homework on that one to know what's. I know what they're the proposing. Public comment. Yeah, I yeah, don't know what they're but proposing. They're going to ask for public comment. On. Okay. That was why I emailed you today because it looked like that meeting was going to be at the same time as the garage meeting, but it's not. Okay. Yeah, I, and I don't know. I'd have to do some work on that. So that was the thought was that we should have, um, mm -hmm. for the municipal planning grant, um, I've done these in the past for, when I was in Barrie, we did them on, on Merchants Row. That was how a lot of the work got done there to come up with how to rearrange the parking areas. We also did master planning for Summer Street area um, and how to accommodate, where do you put 40 parking, where do you put, those were a little bit more area-wide. How do we spend that money? Like. Who outside are you going to hire, just out of curiosity, for the State Street portion? You, like a you'd be looking for probably somebody who's got a combination of engineering and landscape architecture, because you're really looking at streetscapes. So it's not just uh, engineering. It really starts dealing with um, so people like and ADA and how do you, yeah, oh, it definitely have to go to bid. Okay. Traffic flow and all of that. Traffic flow, yep. Yeah, because you'll, you'll want to accommodate the traffic on the street, but then you could start having the discussions of. We do see traffic. But the, but the yeah. focus is on this, as you're saying, the streetscape, so the appearance, aesthetics are a big. Aesthetics, yeah, the, the whole thing for, yeah. for within, we're looking almost exclusively within the city right-of-way or sidewalks that may be within the private group. But we're usually looking almost exclusively at what's in the city right-of-way. Um, but we'll talk, we'll get that for, for the next agenda as well. So that application has to go in by when? Uh, that's the end of September as well. Oh, okay. So that would be, I would first 
do this ArcGIS one, and then afterwards do the municipal planning grant. So on the tent, are we going to be looking at either of those applications? You can probably look at the ArcGIS one. But you'll have that? Yeah, I should have that okay. one either ready or, or close right. to ready. Okay. While we're on the topic of applications, I received this in the mail today. Um, it's from the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Uh, solicitation of municipalities to participate in enhanced or in in, in enhanced energy planning. Um, so this might be something for MEAC, the yeah, Energy Committee. I just wanted to make sure, flag it for, for you and for you, Mike, to make sure it was covered. Um, this would be so the Regional Planning Commission has will be receiving funding to assist three to six municipalities with the development of municipal plan energy elements that are consistent with the provisions of Act 174. So there's an application process and the deadline is October 1st. I just wanted to, I don't think we need to do anything on it as the Planning Commission, but since I received it in the mail, I, I thought I should share it with you all. Um, so what would the better strategy be? I mean, if we decide in the Energy Committee to go forward with it, um, that would be something that we'd coordinate with Mike's office, though. I, that Mike we, would have to answer that question. Professional I mean, it's, entity. Yeah. It sounds like council would probably either need to sign off on you applying or on the on the committee applying or apply itself. That'd be my guess. The city council. Yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts? You're on the energy regional energy regional planning commission. My, I mean, the only thing I would have to add is just from my experience on regional planning commission is that they like to cover their bases, and I think you probably receive that as courtesy. Yeah. Yeah, and Kate Stevenson re received it as well, and she sent it to me. So okay, we'll. Uh, I won't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, we may proceed on it, and then. But I, I agree that we have to go to council to yeah. get the final okay. Yeah. Okay. So, having mentioned it, I'll move on. I don't need to revisit. <laughs> um, other items. I just want to mention. I sent. I shared an email sharing the the tragic news about John Anderson's daughter and we have a card here for everyone to sign and after the meeting we can talk about the best way to, to reach out at all so um, just if anyone does need to leave early we'll just put that next to you Kirby um, and then finally for from comments of the chair I think we should have a quick discussion we'll see how quick we can make it um, at the last meeting here with just the planning commission our last meeting was with all the a lot of committees but the one with just us we were ticking through our uh, matrix of changes to zoning based on the experiences that Mike's office has had in administering the new zoning bylaws um, one of the issues that we talked about was calculating density based on buildable area and lots um, Barb has some concerns about the way that the vote went. So uh, I, I don't want to rehash the vote to the extent that there's no new information. I don't know why, I, I don't think it would be productive for us to re-vote, but I do want to use this opportunity here to help us fully understand the constraints of your office, um, Barb's concerns, and if there are new piece of information, I mean, the two of you were here for the vote, that you, you didn't hear or didn't understand when you voted, please let me know because we will revisit it. I just want to find that balance of making sure we've had uh, a full and robust discussion but not redoing everything twice. That's, that's my concern. So when, um, when we arrived before we called the meeting to order, we started to talk about this a little bit. Um, I'm going to recap what I re understand, and then we can pick up from there. So um, Mike's office is not getting a level of detail that you need to easily be able to tell applicants what amount of density they have if it's based on buildable area. Is that right? Yeah, or the 
information is almost too detailed. It just, it's, it's not easy for us to administer and answer the basic questions that we need to be able to answer. The data we have is actually too detailed and too complicated to be able to easily answer the questions that we need to, even a basic question of, of whether somebody can add a, a new unit to their house. So it's a matter of not having the expertise to interpret data right now. Yes, the GIS data is just too detailed to be able to make a quick, easy determination on some basic questions. Okay. And Barb, your concerns are that we went into that, the original densities for all of the various districts were based in part on the, the idea that they were going to subtract buildable area. Subtract 30% slopes from <coughs> buildable area. Right, well, the, the, you would be calculating density based on buildable area, and buildable barrier area would be excluding 30% slopes as well as other natural resources identified on the inventory, right? Yeah, wetlands and a few others. We didn't make a determination about those, right? We didn't. I, uh, let me see what the... Last week? So, yeah. Yeah, I don't... I don't yeah, there was no discussion of that. We, yeah, we never intended it. But originally, we yeah, to keep originally that, that, to keep that as it was. That was part of what's not buildable. Right, right. So. But we didn't specifically address that in the motion. Yeah, I don't. No, no, I'm I talking more general, so. like the, the policy decision before the bylaw revisions were sent to city council one year ago. That was my understanding of how it was <coughs> structured. Um, so what we talked about before our vote was the difficulty of administering it again. We talked about the various restrictions on building scale, size, massing, uh, setbacks uh, that do restrict the way the building looks in the, in the area, um, how density interplays with that, um, and were there any other pieces to this discussion that I'm not recalling? I think I we had also, I think main. we had talked about the fact that the issues that had come up about buildable area, we, we had kind of addressed it in multiple places. Yeah. So while we had talked about everything in isolation, we had actually ended up addressing the the issue we had was that people were building big houses based on using density that was on steep slopes but we also came up with footprint maximum footprint requirements and maximum height requirements as well so we were kind of addressing the same problem multiple times and it was best managed by setting footprint and bulk and massing size which we have done which were also new to zoning. We didn't have footprint requirements. We now have footprint requirements. So we, we had kind of addressed it in a couple of different places. So maybe this wasn't needed any longer to keep buildings smaller. And Barb, your concern is that it, it may appear to be a bait switch for members of the public who, who understood and, and acquiesced to the uh, zoning proposal based on their understanding that buildable area would be subtracted from density. So the sizing, scaling, not, all that. Not quite, but 30% okay. would be subtracted from the buildable area, and the buildable area would be the basis of determining right. how many units. And, you know, you're, you've been talking about footprint and, and mass and scale, and that's certainly all part of it, but really the issue here is the number of units that would be allowed on a parcel. And so if we don't exclude Help me understand that. All right. All I right. mean, I understand how density is calculated based on slope and how that limits the number of units, but why is that an issue separate from size of the building? Because the number of units could be sprinkled all over the, the property. It doesn't necessarily, especially if you got, if we went and say got a, um, um, a cottage 
cluster, those kinds of, because we have PUDs which also allow for density bonuses. So we've got a lot of ways for, if, if it seems like we're if excluding um, the rights of property owners to, to use their property, we have lots of bonuses that allow for that to happen if they go through the PUD process. So the, really the issue here is, yes, it's good to limit footprints, it's good to limit um, massing and scale and everything else, but it's also important to limit number of units based on the available area of the site, the site area of the site that should be developed. And frankly, 30% slope areas should not be developed. So that if you, you know, if you're looking at a piece of property, I mean, it's sort of an example I gave before, if you look at Sabin's Pasture, if that were to be subdivided so that only the southeast, is it southeast? Um, yes, southeast corner was a parcel on its own, um, and previously it would not be developable because it has 30% slopes. But if we eliminate that, then any number of units could potentially be put on that property. And whether or not they should be built there, you know, is another question. But that was what I hoped we had handled by virtue of creating, looking at it from the standpoint of buildable area, not the standpoint of what's, what, is, what are the outlines of this particular site. So, but I guess the, the question is still, so that a, a maximum allowable density is not the right to build that many units. Um, and the slope factor is not also, if we're using it to calculate maximum allowable density, we're not saying anyone can build on that slope. So if someone can build you know, 10 units now, or, um, and they can build 50 afterwards, what is the, um, how is it in the public interest to limit, let's say 10 families can move in here, now 50 can, what are we trying to address? What's bad about those extra 40 families moving here? We're trying to address the, na the character of the neighborhoods that these are going into. And we've already increased the density significantly wait, 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 wait. in some of those. What does character of the area mean? Like the character type of, of people? Type no, of no, no, the number of in? units. There's a, you know, so there's a street with predominantly one. I don't one think of character as number of units. It's the size of the buildings and the number of families that are there, the street, you know, cars on the street, all of that. Um, so if you have a, a street of one to three family structures and suddenly you come in with 50, um, because now you're allowed to build that there. And by the way, we did allow for building on 30% slopes, didn't we? Uh, in one of our we're, we're, we're lifting the prohibition, requiring engineering plans and a hearing. Just the hearing, I thought. And engineering plans, yeah. Engineering plans and a hearing. That's so. There's no engineering plans required for building on 30 percent slope. Well, it's prohibited previously. We're lifting the prohibition, and in its place, we're requiring engineering plans and yes. a hearing. Right. That's so, what my notes say. So now we, the people can build on those 30 percent slopes as well. So it's. I'm not saying that. I mean, I totally agree that additional density is really valuable and important and we have the opportunity to create additional density that is still in character with the neighborhoods and I think if we, we have to be very cautious about making sort of quick decisions that can have all kinds of other ramifications because we spent months talking about these different density number of units per, per parcel we spent months debating that and we had a lot of comment from the public. But now, Mike, you said that the density was calculated based on 90%, right? Yeah, when we did those 90% analyses, we did not factor in any slopes when we did those. So it's still, I mean, it's still an arbitrary number, that 90% figure, because we, we, we tried to set it at 90% and it would come out, you know, somewhere around 90 percent. Tried to set what at 90 percent? So what we previously had in the old zoning was entire neighborhoods. Um, a good example is if you go up off First Street and Kent Street in that area, 
um, almost 60 to 70 percent of all parcels were non-conforming and most of the structures were also non-conforming because the setbacks and, and the parcel sizes were somewhat arbitrarily picked. So there was a minimum lot size of I think 9,000 square feet and most parcels were less than 9,000 square feet. So every time somebody came in to do something, um, uh, if you were up on Town Hill, the rear setbacks were 75 feet and the front setbacks were 30 feet. Most lots had no buildable land because if you factored in where the rear setback and the, where the front setback was, there actually was no place to build. So what we did was did a 90% rule. We, we just looked at every parcel to go and say, all right, where do most front setbacks? Just you know. trying to adjust the zoning to match what was on the ground. Oh, okay. So we yeah. so that's yeah. 90%, 90%, 90 percent of the property oh, okay. in the neighborhood. Okay. You know, we always know there are going to be some that you can just look and go and say that's probably a bad idea that that parcel was that small. So we kind of said 10 percent of the parcels will let be non-conforming. 10 percent of the structures will let be non-conforming. Let's just try to find rules that somewhat match what's on the ground, assuming that we like what the neighborhoods look like. Yeah, the um, prior zoning wouldn't have any allowed the Montpelier to build the way it was built. Yeah, yeah. So we want, we, you know, everybody mm -hmm. agrees they like the city how it is, so why, do we, why did we make it illegal? <laughs> yeah, why yeah, did we make it we, illegal yeah. to build yeah, this okay. city? So no, we, I, I, yeah. I yeah. understood that was a concept in the previous zoning, of just the 90% reference. The 90%. Yeah. But now I understand what you're All right. We want to make sure 90% of the buildings in this neighborhood would be conforming to the standards we're setting. Yeah. And so the 90% calculations for density uh, were not taking into account or like subtracting 30% slopes is, is what I'm hearing. But what Mike was just alluding to was that that 90% determination was based on the size of the parcels and potentially mm -hmm. making them, the ones you referenced, for example, uh, making those single or family homes or duplexes be able to have a conforming lot. 90% of those lots would be conforming with a single family home on it. Because we allowed a single family home on any size parcel, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we didn't. That 90% really technically was looking at the footprint size of the building, was looking at the parcel boundaries, mm -hmm. um, not looking at the number of units. Right, and that's allowing on this. Parcel. Right, because that's where we get a little like we tend to kind of overreach as to how many people can live in a given building. I, I get really uncomfortable when we start messing with that. Mm -hmm. We did two calculations. We did two calculations. We did one for minimum lot size and one for density when we did the 90%. So if you look at the, the book that was made, there was a little yeah, book it. that was made that has both columns, one for what's the 90% for density of that neighborhood because especially when you look at a place like Liberty Street or these other streets that have a lot of multifamily, it factored in, but didn't factor in, didn't, didn't exclude, didn't first exclude unbuildable land before it made those calculations. It just looked at the lot size. So for my vote last week, I can tell you, I mean, that what was most compelling for me was for one, as we already went over tonight, that other regulations are in place to safeguard against the things we're talking about for character of the neighborhood. And, and then slope being another thing that in a way like gets at density for me, I'm not seeing a nexus or a connection between a parcel that's more limited and what, it, they, and what a person can do with it because it, or like arbitrarily because of the slope, not, not because of the physical constraints of the slope itself, but the way that we had, we had set it up previously just the presence of the slope means that you that for the person unfortunate enough to have a lot of 30 percent slopes it's almost like they're not in that neighborhood they're in a low they're in a different density like requirement type neighborhood and i just didn't see the connection between the slopes and like the slopes were being misused in my view because they didn't have the policy connection that other things the other regulations that exist do have does that make sense 
Well, I guess I'm not really following the concept that our footprint and uh, height limitations would necessarily have the same effect. That's what you're saying is other, other requirements are in place. So the ones that were mentioned were footprint, massing of the building, Set potentially backs. height. Set, Those everything. Plan, condition use, subdivision regulations. If, design requirements. If those are, yeah, if those are part of that um, application. Which, when do, when does, do those come in? When does conditional use come in? It would depend on the neighborhood. And okay. in some cases, something could be prohibited. I mean, somebody could still have, be able to build 10 units, but if multifamily is not allowed in that neighborhood, they wouldn't be allowed to put 10 units. So this, this then puts uh, Sibley have back on the map then they could potentially have had how many units if they could fit all of those 16 units into the bulk and massing because that was the issue was that that was a in order to fit 16 units on that parcel they had to go and put them all in one big building and it was going to be a 5,000 square foot but they could footprint. have now they can't do buildings that big right but if they they could have stepped it down the hill because we're going to allow them to build on a 30 percent slope so they could have broken up that building into multiple buildings and still have how many units have, were they allowed 16? Well, that's assuming they made it through the but whole they hearing weren't, process and got they approved. weren't uh, I don't uh, know uh, that. under under the old zoning which had no footprint requirements and had no slope requirements they still had to go and they still couldn't, they had to fit the 16 to that one big building. They, that was the only way that they could fit 16 and they eventually decided not to do it. Actually, I mean, that was the least expensive way because they were building at the, head, at the top of the hill. But that's not saying that they could not possibly have Work so them into the, anyway. we're going down a rabbit hole yeah. here. Yeah, I mean, I mean they would have, have to engineer. From either of you two, are there any other concerns about this? I mean, the the pieces that we voted on last week that this is related to is um, item in the chart. It's item 26, which is um, removing buildable areas from density calculations. And we voted on that um, to adopt staff recommendation four to one with Barb dissenting uh, and then item 32 which is to remove the prohibition building on 30 percent slopes and in its place require engineering plans and a hearing. Is there any standards for the someone could come up with engineering plans that suggest it's a terrible idea to do this but if there are no standards by which it's good was well, the idea is if it's going to the hearing we do have staff downstairs in the engineering department who do review it, and usually what they what they are reviewing for. And maybe I can put a note that we should be more expressly clear in what we're asking for them to demonstrate. But what usually what Kurt is looking for is a foundation plan and a slope stability analysis. So what he's looking for is that is is a demonstration that whatever the engineering is going to work is going to make that structure safe and then separately they look at an erosion control plan um, if there's anything on the 30 percent slope then generally what they're looking for is to make sure bank stability is maintained and other so should we be clear about those that that's what's being I can certainly put that as a note if we want. Well, and one of the issues with bank stability is that you can't plant, plant grass on anything higher than a 30% slope. So establishing bank stability at 30% is is iffy. So yeah. at least with an engineered plan, you know, I would feel more. Yeah, usually what we're looking, for, what he's looking for in the engineered plan is usually these steeper slopes are are going to be used um, with retaining walls or some other type of engineered thing that's going to keep the bank. Yeah. And that's the issue that we had with under the old rules. Um, you the couldn't. The is complete and absolute. It's complete and absolute and you yeah. can't build a culvert across, you know, you can't put in a curb cut across a, a roadside ditch because roadside ditches were three to one slopes and 
three to one slopes of 30 percent and therefore you can't put in a new curb cut we said that just isn't functionally working we need to have at least some opportunity to address especially in these small cases of an ability to manage the slope especially if you're going to say i'm going to remove the 30 percent slope and make it a 10 percent slope and therefore i can then plant vegetation on it well i mean we could um remove that 30 percent slope allowance and limit it to specific areas if your concern had to do with drainage and culverts not the whole site i mean is that I'm not interested in building on that kind of slope. I mean, do you think most people are going to... There's one across the street from me. Yeah. It almost ended yeah. up in the backyard of my neighbors. Yeah. Well, it was it was frightening. Either they didn't do engineering plans they or... Did. They did. Maybe you needed a different engineer. <laughs> um, all right. Any, any more discussion about the steep slope? the removal of the 30% slopes or any more questions? I guess um, I would make a motion then if we go forward with this the way it was voted on last time mm -hmm. that we should address the number of units allowed in all of the districts again. Revisit. Because it was based on conditions that are no longer under consideration. Okay. Um, does anyone want to second the motion for discussion? We could... I'll second for discussion. Sure. Yeah. We can have a discussion. Okay. I guess that, maybe I'm not understanding that, but when we have to look at every parcel then? How, every how neighborhood. We, no, every... every every um, zone, every district, because we set the limitations by district, and those districts were based on on, um, on Mike's 90% rule for the most part. Um, and we told the public that that's what we were doing, that we I, based those on that. I would definitely think that we should to the extent we can get some information on this to know how much how much uh, of what percentage of parcels across the entire city have these kinds of slopes and like getting that basic information and putting it before the, the city council when we make a recommendation to give them an informed you know to let them make an informed decision I think we definitely need to do that but as far as like on the front end going in and and revisiting the density um, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with just making slope a non-factor and acknowledging at the same time, being very clear city council, yes, this might mean that the, the densities are now more lenient than what you may have believed before. And let them, again, like I said, find out specifically how lenient that is and passing that info along. I, I, I do think we should do that. I think the other piece of the information would, could be that it is technically possible to, to measure these things just a question of resources and that staff currently doesn't have the resources but that's also an option that could be pursued. They, might, they may have the software but they don't have the personnel for example that they've got potentially. Right and it's it may not be a question of personnel it could be something that's contracted out we don't know Mm -hmm. Exactly. The okay. devil's in the details, but that's another option. So contracted out to, to uh, engineer someone um, who could readily, easily make a determination. Right. Or they could pre-process pre a lot of stuff and answer those questions. The problem then becomes what's the sustainability of that and when do you, how do you maintain it or update it or when we make changes. But all of that's certainly certainly possible. It's just a question of do we is that worth the resources and is that going to help us accomplish uh, our goals? Maybe maybe not. I don't know. But I think we can communicate that to City Council. 
Okay. That means, so what Kirby's suggesting is that we need some kind of an assessment of how many parcels, the parcels in the city that have 30% slopes on them. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I, th I think it would help to pass that information along, and yeah, I, would, I, I would be in support of that. I would also point out that just going off of what John said, I mean, for me, too, as just a person who studied policy and, like, really values simplicity when it comes to regulations and, and, and law creation, that I like the idea of cutting, factoring in the slope into it. I don't think it adds enough to justify the added, added complexity, even if we can afford to do it. I don't think it's a good use of resources. I mean, I, I make that point too. And I do feel like we got to a place with a lot of people where density was just a proxy for other concerns, like building size, um, other maybe traffic and circulation issues. Um, like before, when we asked, like, really, what is it that we're getting at? And then yeah. you said building size and then parking on the street. If that's what it boils down to, then those are things we can address. Density is sort of a blunt hammer that we're saying, you know, unless you can afford this much land, you can't live. The people in the the um, up on Town Hill, Town Hill, um, I'm not sure that that was the issue for them. The issue for them was parcel size, single fam, how many families are going to be on each particular parcel size, yeah, and it's for, true. It's for not them, for, it's. Not for everyone. Um, yeah, so I just think well, that we definitely didn't please everyone with our No, but we we did we went a track. long way to adjust our numbers in order to make them feel more comfortable. Um, and of course we adjusted the numbers to make 67% of their parcels non-conforming, but mm -hmm. right, right. And well. and it's pretty it's they should be on on there may be a few parcels. They should yeah, well they're they had some level of protection for some of the parcels by exclusion of the 30% slope because then they felt like, oh, this might, so my neighbor can't suddenly turn their property into four families because they don't have the available area. Maybe now they, they may have that, but that would take, you know, more of an analysis, as Kirby said, of um, parcels that actually have the 30% yeah, slope. That's just, that gets us right back to the same thing. If there's just, there's just no way I'm going to have the resources to be able to do that analysis. Just that's the reason why we've got this problem in the first place is the fact that to do that analysis is going to require way more expertise and computation than we can actually perform. And again, it comes back to what's what is the the value I think in the end of I think we can present doing them with the map though. I mean, we yeah, can that's what I was thinking. I mean, I was uh, we yeah. just show them the map. And well, I was thinking. I mean, we we do know like about what percentage of the land is 30% or more in slope, right? We have a map. I mean, we, could, yeah, and we, can, we can do it. We have the LIDAR. And yeah. just give estimates based on neighborhoods and in what areas of the city that this impacts the most. Just that basic info. You see, as long. you see from the map, most of the red is concentrated <laughs> here. Yes, yeah. Except the red is also roots, right, on that map? It, well, I mean, it, it so can. I'm afraid that could be really misleading looking. To look it, at it, it, in some cases it excluded it, in some cases it didn't. It just got, it depends, I think, on whatever John. algorithm yeah. they had run. I'm afraid maps actually make it look like a bit more of an impact than it really is because it includes some false positives, I think you would call it. Those are pretty minor in general. Are they? Yeah. I mean, a lot of, the, the parcel that you had clearly excluded the buildings from the 30% slopes, that, the one that you showed us before. Uh, yeah, um, but so. what we end up when, in our specific concern with this one was when we got to especially smaller parcels, and that was why some of the suggestions I had were to eliminate using it on small areas. We have on Main Street some actual applications that came in um, as you pass the school and start going up the hill, there were some parcels in there where either they wanted to subdivide or they wanted to go from uh, two units to four units. And the question was, okay, how much buildable land do you have? And a lot of the red was actually within the footprint of the buildings. But we, we ended up making people jump through a lot of hoops because we just don't have the ability to answer the basic questions of, you know, how much how many developable units can you have? And the project that they had 
once you excluded the slopes that were within the existing footprint, they had to hire an engineer, and they did hire an engineer to do the analysis and to remove these densities so they could prove that they could build this project, but it just, the question starts to come up. Not everyone is going to have the resources that these guys did to hire an engineer to go and do this stuff, and is it really worth it on these small, small parcels to be really making people jump through that many hoops, rather than just go and say, how big is your parcel and how many units? That's the way 90% of the towns in Vermont are. How big is your parcel? That's how many units you have. Now, you may not be able to realize all of your potential if you can't fit enough cars on, on, on the parcel, off-lot, off-street parking. You still have to meet your off-street parking requirements. You still have to meet bulk and massing requirements. You still have to meet setback requirements. It's not our obligation to make sure you can fully realize all of the d density that's available to you. Even on Sibley, Sibley could have built 23 units. They were only proposing 16 because they couldn't possibly Given due the to the slopes. Given that they know where they wanted to build it, and reasonably they didn't. Well, if that had been a fully flat parcel, they could have. So, but I guess we have the, a motion on the table. Um, I just want to address one thing that you said, Mike. So that you talked about a particular project. Was that a project where they had four units and they were looking to go six? That was no. That was a we had two of them on that same stretch of road, one of which was a single family home that wanted to subdivide. Um, and they had the area to subdivide, but they couldn't subdivide without first calculating whether or not they would have enough buildable area on the new lot. But they're automatically allowed to duplex according to the zoning. So if it was a one family, they should have been able to do it. But they twice. wanted to subdivide. They wanted to take their parcel and subdivide it oh, into subdivide two parcels, parcels. I see. and yeah. then use the second parcel to put another single family home on. But they had to have enough buildable land on that parcel. So they have enough land. I mean, it's a, three, it's a res 3,000, and they had 8,000 square feet. Plenty of land to subdivide into two 3,000 square foot lots. But they couldn't until they did a density calculation to determine whether or not they had enough density so on each of the parts. As interesting anyway. as each example is, <laughs> I don't think it's really moving the discussion along very well. And I, you know, well, we're already an hour in. So um, we have a pending motion from Barb, um, which was to go back and recalculate the densities for every zoning district. Is that the, the motion? Okay. Based on this change to the zoning ordinance. OK. Any other discussion before we vote on this motion? All right, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Or just to say nay. Nay. It's <laughs> a little bit more clear. What was that, John? We're not used um, to voting nay on this. So, <laughs> OK, so the motion doesn't carry. What I did hear were some other suggestions based on this idea that we should probably do a little bit more legwork before we send this to council. Um, maybe not the level of detail of going through and redoing all the zoning uh, or the density calculations, but um, I heard a couple of suggestions, one from Kirby, one from John. Maybe we can document these and, and turn these into um, a proposal. Well, Mike indicated he doesn't have that information. Well, some of it. So what can we give them? Yeah, yeah. OK. What can we give them? And my suggestion was made, and you know, to the extent that it's not overburdensome on Mike and his staff, some basic information on how this will, will impact the city, I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, yeah, Mike, could we, take, them with the map could we take each zone and just, I mean, I guess the scale, at what scale do you look at this? Um, but if the issue is, uh, or I hate to say it, each neighborhood, and look at the LIDAR for each neighborhood. And just that particular parcel would then give you a sense of how much, how 30% slope there might be in any particular neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it doesn't factor in a lot of the other factors that, it's just diluting everything down to a point. It's like I said, it's getting back to Sibley and saying, well, you've got, you know, 
23 units, but they could never build 23 units. So even if we look at this and go and say, well, this will, you know, potentially allow a unit, a, a property owner on Prospect Street now could, instead of having just a single family or a duplex, could now have a quadplex because we're calculating in this full 30% slope. But when you look at the parcel, you'd never be able to build it and put in parking for the four additional and for the two additional cars or it's it's not buildable anyways for other reasons other than the density but all we care about is looking at each particular neighborhood and seeing what the impact is of the slope i mean i think all of this information should be conveyed to council with this i mean it's it's the implications of removing buildable area from density, density calculations um, will be felt most prominently in these particular neighborhoods or these particular areas of the city. Um, however, we do want to mention that various other restrictions from building may, may end up hampering development in those, those areas, even with the elimination of and, and the opposite so, is is so can also be true though is this the thirty percent slope may be eliminating potential like we said we had to do this calculation for a property on Elm Street even though they weren't building any buildings they were just going to add two units to an existing building okay wait we're going back to the one example thing again but want to get away from that. <laughs> We do that a lot with the historic preservation folks that I but it gets, yeah, But it's that type of, yeah, but it is that the, the argument can be argued both ways. Though. Right. So and that I same argument, they're going to say that they have the potential that they may never be able to realize. I think we, we present. We also can keep the rules in. We present the options. We present our recommendation. So the options are remove buildable area as we voted. Um, here are the potential implications. Look at the map. Another option is keep keep that as it was don't change anything and you calculate density based on buildable area but if that's going to be the way we move forward then we're going to need additional resources we're not recommending that because we're concerned that it may not be a good use of resources um, but it ultimately is city council's recommendation i think that maybe we draft a memo or something to this effect that has a little bit more detail in it um, i think Mike can probably convey that, right? I don't. I, I want to work on the plan. <laughs> I agree. I, I agree, Rather but I. A memo really shouldn't be too t time consuming. Will Barb and Mike, will you be able to work together on a memo? <laughs> because you each I have opposite. No, we, we have different opinions. Have, uh, well, we, that's we why I know the issues. memo is going to be balanced. <laughs> We've had different opinions in the past, Mike. I, yes. just wanna, I mean, I think that he, it's the two of you or it's someone completely neutral, and then no. the two of you are going to have a lot of opinions, so it might as well just be the two of you. Although I think right. both of you will be probably be at city council and can probably express the these ideas and have with the follow-up questions. I just want to make efficient use of people's time. If you guys really want to write a memo, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you're right. You're so right, John. I'm, as a planning commission, or as a planning commission member, I'm here. saying there's not, I don't see a lot of value in, in getting into the details in a memo. I'd like right. to go on record. So I, that's why I want to see it. I want to see the memo mm -hmm. in writing and very clear. So, so that the planning commission will also, I mean, sorry, the city council will also see it in writing. And it's not going to take us forever. No. Yeah. So, and you guys don't even have to, you know, concern yourself. Well, we, we're probably going to want to review it if it's a planning no, commission can recommendation. It. Yeah, but once Mike and I have worked this out, it should be seamless, right, Mike? Yes. <laughs> All right. Look, I'll, I'll, I'm willing to, to help if you need it. Any help on the lifting as well? Okay. Right. I mean, my bigger interest. I mean, same, same as John. Is is this is really. A lot of these were meant to be rather straightforward review of issues that had come up in the zoning and that this was going to be a relatively quick amendment to the to the zoning and I don't want us to get caught in rabbit I, holes on this for I agree no however we shouldn't we shouldn't just ignore um, no. 
potentially large policy implications. So, we, you know, you're both you're both right. You're both wrong. We're all <laughs> right. We're all wrong. I mean, it's just how it is. These are not easy decisions, but I appreciate everyone working through this. Um, can I move on from buildable area and slopes? Yes. Okay. One more item on comments from the chair. I know we have comments oh, from the chair. We're still there. Yes, we're still there. <laughs> I'm keeping track even if no one else is. You may have seen when you walked in, there was a slew of meeting minutes um, on the table. None of them have been put on the agenda for review for tonight, so we're not going to be voting on them or the ones that are on the agenda because those were not among the slew of minutes on the table. Um, I was shooting in the dark when I made the agenda because Mike was on vacation. So, fine. Um, your task will be to look at the meeting minutes from these past minutes before our next meeting. And these are from the meetings of January 22nd, May 14th, July 9th, and July 23rd. Hopefully we'll have August 13th to review as well at that point. Um, and if not, we have plenty of others to approve. And then uh, we're going to go through them really quickly at the next meeting. So take a look at them in advance. OK, that's it for comments from the chair. Item for general business, which is comments from the public about something not on the agenda. We have one member of the public here. Nothing. OK. <laughs> um, item five. Let's talk about the all committee city plan kickoff meeting and next steps. Um, I thought it was it was energizing to see all of the all of the people and committees working for the city <laughs> and what how much overlap there was um, and I took a lot of notes and we have all of the goals downstairs in Mike's office, I believe. Yep. On those large pieces of paper. And so, are those going to be typed up or can they be typed up? Well, that's yes. part of our discussion yeah. is what, what should we do now? I mean, how should we move forward? So typing them up sounds like a good... Um, yeah, I'd love to review those to remember yeah. something that was said. Is that something, I mean, is that a task we can delegate to Tammy or to... I mean, Audra I, probably has plenty on her plate. I, I just, I know you're... Yeah, I can, I'll see what we can come up with. Okay. Thanks. I mean, just the broad topics. I mean, not all, any, any detail. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I might just be able to, you know, find whoever to just go through and put whatever you're, because you took the notes and put the heading and then just type up whatever was literally on, there. Yeah, and hopefully on there and just go and call it and yeah. bolt them right out. Or even like photos of that, you know, at the yeah. very least, just to capture. It would, yeah, I think it would, because uh, I did generally ask the presenters to uh, make sure that their goals were accurately reflected. Mm -hmm. So it would be great to see them typed up. Yeah. Be one of the first things we add to our website. Of course, it might not be in all the correct order because I've got them all in sheets and I haven't actually. Oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> they can be in any order. They'll be in any. It was random anyway. Yeah, it was random. Yeah. Um, no, I think there's potential overlap with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to lose our momentum. And, and like John said, we should work on the city plan and not <laughs> go back and rehash the zoning that we love so much. <laughs> like this, you mean? Yeah. yeah, well, there's some things we're going to have to do. Um, but, you know, as far as today in this meeting, I, I would rather we spend the rest of our time talking about what we want to do for developing the city plan. Um, sorry, Mike. Do you absolutely need us to go through these? Well, we will continue ticking through them, but, um, but yeah, I mean, for today, I'm not sure how much time we're going to be able to give that and the city plan. We obviously needed to talk through some of the buildable area mm -hmm. issue. Um, so what, what are, I mean, I guess one of the first topics that we should discuss is with 
our website, committee members were asking whether there was going to be a folder for their committee or there'd be a folder based on topic. Um, my inclination is that we should do it based on topic and have various committees contributing to it. Uh, other people my thought. So I guess I would advocate for com by committee just so people have their space uh -huh. and um, we bring things together and organize the plan by topic, obviously not by committee. Um, and it'll be interesting to see where different committees, you know, may have the same recommended actions or strategies, but it may be... You don't think it's going to encourage siloed work? Um, I mean, I, so I, I think the committees don't need to limit what they write to anything that's in that specific topic, right? So we can tag things in terms of advancing a goal in different like the committees will have their folder, but what they write on doesn't need to be, con they don't have to worry about the boundaries of uh, being within you know, that committee's purview necessarily or not. And then when we bring, in to bring together all the you know, goal strategies, actions, targets, et cetera, hopefully with identified um, people responsible and, and relevant programs and projects, um, that's where the where we have the fun exercise of putting things in different uh, topics, and things can be in different topics, right? We don't have to. Yeah. Otherwise, you end up with like, well, are we going to put this in housing or transportation or you know energy or it kind of belongs in all of these? And now we're saying, just don't worry about it. Like, put down what that idea is, and we can uh, frame it in the plan after. So uh, that would be my suggestion, just for uh, for allowing people to work through it, and and understanding that some people are probably not going to embrace like the the folder and whatever Google Sheet we put out. So also having um, essentially, you know, an easier to use survey format, or even maybe a box that people can write things in here at, at City Hall uh, if they don't want to use a, a computer or do it digitally. Who are you talking about in terms of people? Are you talking about the committees themselves? Well, I think I think everybody. I think hopefully the committees can have more structured mm -hmm. uh, input and can follow these guidelines, but I think we should try to be as inclusive as possible and capture as many different mediums, uh, mediums and, and levels of ability and uh, preferences and how people us information. So we did talk about um, a public input piece of the website, right? right? So they could use that potentially. Are you, so I'm, I'm not clear who you're talking about. Are you talking about committee members who might be putting things in um, or, or members of the public? Uh, both. I think um, committees, you know, we'll give them the option we can pre create folders with the templates that they can just jump in and, and use. Um, if for whatever reason, committees like, we can't figure this out or we don't want to figure this out, can we just write this down for you? You figure sure. it out. Yeah. We don't want to like, I, I think necessarily, uh, hopefully our committees can, can respond to that. But I'm thinking of those people who are not maybe necessarily part of a committee to make sure that they also feel like they can provide input and, and ideas. Maybe we're getting away from the question we were trying to answer. Because. I just want to have a brainstorm about the whole thing, so let it organically. Yeah, I, was, yeah, I think I was going to originally go with what was Leslie was thinking with the, the various topics, but I think you're, I like your ideas. It lets us yeah. be able to go back more easily to the originator of an idea if we if we just get everything in housing, we might not know whether that came from, you know, the housing committee. Um, you know, yeah. we've got the housing task force, but we also have Montpelier Housing Authority. So, you know, who gave us that idea? Um, and they don't even have to try to put it in any basket. It'd be yeah. interesting just to look at all these ideas together. And we could set it up so that 
essentially they can just hit when an idea is ready to go to the planning commission. They say, okay, we like where this is at now. They can select that one and then they'll all go into one place and we'll know, we can go back and see, but we can also not do that and just look at them all together. Could we set up the format in such a way that it would uh, automatically link to a, a document that's by topic? So any mention of housing would, at least for us, would come together um, into a particular housing Oh, you document. mean tagging So basically various... doing both of it, both of those, yeah. Yeah, we could, we could filter it that way, or we could go through as an idea comes in. I mean, we could ask people to do it, but it'd be, um, I think, simple enough for us or Mike or anybody to, to tag it under whatever baskets we want to look at. And then, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because ultimately it's going to go into chapters. So, yeah. so one thing that came up in the meeting that stuck with me was when some of the committees asked, basically they were asking to be assigned a basket. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize that like at this early stage, we don't want to narrow our thinking, and we also probably don't want committees to feel territorial about like baskets or different chapters. So, any I think to, I think what you're saying is great, and the fact that it avoids territorial behavior or people th thinking limiting themselves unnecessarily, uh, those are two things I think that we need to consciously try to make sure don't happen. And that sounds like both of those things are accomplished by setting it up and just have the committees go wild with any goals that they think are priority and then us worrying about cat categorizing them later. I think that sounds Maybe sounds we perfect. set up like one pilot with one committee and say, hey, will you be our, our guinea pig? And Think of the energy committee. Energy, housing yeah, are usually pretty good. Yeah. Actually, it'd be great to have two of them so we could sort of look at that See overlap. How they, yeah. They work how do the overlaps happen? So maybe we, we you know, within by our next meeting, aim to have that set up uh, for two committees. Where are we on the formatting of the website? I mean, we, we don't have baskets set up. That's pretty easy to do, though, for I think. each committee yet, right? Right, and I think the website, at least uh, as far um, for anywhere in the near future, I don't think we set up uh, those types of baskets, it's, it would be more like, here's how, right, there'll be folders in the Google Drive that everyone can, can go look at, but um, in terms of the website, it's, here's what's happening, here's how to participate, here's some background information on, on Montpelier. Here, we can also set up, like, the progress that the committees are doing in terms of here ideas that, uh, that they've submitted so far, but in terms of, like, trying to um, you know, get the chapters set up as individual pages right now. Maybe I would recommend. No, I guess what I was saying is, oh, so if the energy committee has their their goals that they want to put in, where would they put them? And you talked about having one a file for each oh, committee. Right, right. So are those files set up? For the no. Okay. So the the idea is doing the the pilot one for two committees to make sure that it's. Or, or to identify, we know it's not going to be perfect, to identify those problems, get some feedback uh, so that their people are, are um, conveying their ideas or goals in the same uh, or similar uh, schema and format so that we can bring them together. Is there a basic, you know, like basic information format that we might want each committee to fill out just so that, you know, we make sure we get the basic information the same for each one. Um, yes, and I think that's the key, get, getting that right and figuring out what works and doesn't with those first two committees and, and, and the planning commission. My um, original thought was to basically try to get, um, get things in two, uh, two baskets one, looking at goals and measurable objectives, so sort of like the what and how do we know that when we've got there, and the other being strategies, which could be actions or policies, rather than maybe, you could kind of split those up into, you know, here are our goals, here's our measures, our objectives, but I think limiting it to two and then having within those, 
you know, what is the objective here? What's the measure? How do we know when we accomplish it? What's, you know, target date or data source? And then uh, is there any, like, background information or other documents that you could, could tie to this for the goals and objectives? And then the, the strategies, you know, what's the action or policy? What goal or does it relate to? Who would be responsible for this? Is there a project or a program that's linked to it? Um, Those might come later, you know, because that's quite a development. Yeah, and I think there's right. going to be a certain amount of processing that's going to come through that we're going to take and compile and go back to them to go through, and, you know, because nobody's going to get it perfect. And, you know, so as long as we've got the idea of where they're going and what they're trying to do, the committee's trying to do, we can do a certain amount of processing to bring it back and go, and as long as we've got it relatively close, we can be able to bring it back and say, this is how, this is what we heard, this is how we kind of reworded your... So to, to proceed, if we're going to do something before the next meeting, then um, is, this, is there some kind of a base format that you want to put together or that you've already put together? Um, and then we use that to get basic information and sure. then start from there? I can send that out um, this week. Some of it will probably be like coming up with like on the page some of the qualifiers or some instructions rather than just like a spreadsheet. Sure. With, yeah. Uh, with maybe a couple of examples. Um, so what if I send that out and then we can all look at it and mm -hmm. try to finalize that by the next meeting? Yeah. I could try and input to it and right. with the information that I have from the energy committee. We can see. How that works. That works. Yeah. Okay. Idea. All right. Yeah. If you could send it out, and I'm sure Stephanie would be interested in helping right. you with that too. Yeah. She said she would be. Um, for some of these other elements, like that, would probably be premature for some of the committees or whoever to get into. Do you, should we identify them now and maybe gray them out? But just to signal, like this is what we're going to be looking at and maybe to get them thinking about it. So if we're going to evaluate some of these things and try to prioritize, maybe have them thinking about it as well. Like, what's going to be, how effective is that? What's going to be the most effective thing that we can do uh, with the least amount of risk? Like, try to get folks thinking of a, like, how do we just make the most of our, our resources and get the biggest, biggest bang for our buck? I think that would be helpful for the committees to know where they're going right. with that, so we don't, they don't just get to a point and then stop, and then we have to kind of get them energized again to go to the next step. But with the explanation that we're not expecting them to necessarily yeah. have this all under in in hand. Don't do this, but think about right, it. Right, think about it. Yeah. yeah that'll be great to have that. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking because Labor Day is between the two meetings, so whatever you. And there was, um, what is it, Laura from the RDC sent an email? Um, from Montpelier. Uh, the, Montpelier yeah, Development the, Corp. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Development um, Corp, yeah. I had sent an email because she had worked on some stuff, I think, in Lanca Lancaster. So maybe she's just someone who could also put some time in working on this or has some ideas. Did uh, people read that article about Lancaster? Did you see it? Yeah. In Pennsylvania, right? Yeah. Lancaster, Pennsylvania? Yeah. It was a op-ed in the New York Times that then got reproduced in the Times Argus. So, let's see. Oh, yeah. Um, ironically, it's called Can American Politics Still Work? But that's really not what it's about. It's about Lancaster. So, anyway. Um, and um, also, maybe on the site, we could also um, put some of these other kinds of resources for, uh, like the Ed McMahon tape, if we can come across, I guess we could, you know, anything that we could put there, just sort of give them some background yeah. information. Other than the Secor art, which is of course inspiring. Sorry, the what? <laughs> do, we, do we have some Secor art? We do. Oh. I, uh, I asked James Secor, local artist, if we could use some uh, images of his art. Of Which is of Montpelier. Montpelier. He was amenable to it. So. Yeah, oh, I like it. 
But yeah, I think the Ed McMahon video, there's the TED Talk, and the... The Sustainable Montpelier. The Sustainable Montpelier uh, one. Plans. Yeah, and there's some, there's some other ones that are YouTube segments mm -hmm. that I can submit that I think I sent out to most everybody. Yeah. Does Team Bridges have a Oh, yeah, yeah, we should definitely video? include that, too. So all of these video clips yeah, can have somewhere to live. Also, I'm wondering, I didn't think about this before, but do we want to have a place um, in this whole thing for the Team Bridges presentation? Because there's a lot of background information that is not yet necessarily part of the Yeah, I think the same, we'll have a, depo a repository with um, all of these resources, just say so resources about planning in Montpelier, and we can include that there. Okay. Yeah, what's nice is we're not limited by space or. Yeah, and I think we want these groups because I know the Parks Commission has said you guys should have a copy of the green print. Well, that's a great opportunity for them. You know, whatever they have as data, you know, I may not have everything done in the planning office. So if you've got it, put it in the Google Drive and we all then have it and we can decide what we want to link to you know because we're trying to keep this plane short when we're done and we really want to be able to link to you know if we've got a green print that identifies this we don't have to restate the green print we just kind of summarize it in a sentence or two put a link to it and use that as an approach there's certainly several different proposals coming up in the next few weeks that potentially could be added on to this as well, such as the scoping study. Yeah, the scoping study, complete streets plan. I mean, there's a lot of the um, parking garage. Parking garage. A lot of a lot of proposals that we can just link to rather than rehash. By the way, if people didn't know. Uh, the September 5th is going to be the public comment discussion of the parking garage. And it's an expanded version. I don't know if that's still going to be across the way or here. I don't know. I haven't. I've, I've been out for the past two weeks, basically. Oh, okay. I'm sure well, it'll be on the website. Bill just came, yeah. Bill just changed that today. Because it was going to be this week, so where the I think where the parking garage goes, <laughs> how big it is, what it what just it places. Changed. Just changed. Hmm? You just changed the location today. <laughs> they enlarged it. No, no, he didn't. But no, he changed the location of the meeting, which was going to coincide with the scoping study. So it's no longer going to. All so, right. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I know we've talked about this before, but I just um, am wondering and remind me if we've discussed this before. So, is the main outside of the committees? If other, are we going to have other ways to outreach to the public, or is it basically going to be this website? Other comments. Um, I mean, it could be that really the you know I don't want to over drain resources trying to reach out to people who aren't interested in commenting on the city plan but I, I did have a little bit of a concern after the meeting that you know it's a certain type of person person like me who wants to be on yeah. you know town committees and if we can try and reach out to people who aren't that I think one, one cool thing about the website is that we can all promote it separately in all sorts of different ways once we get it up and running. Yeah. And, so. and we will have a, pres a series of public meetings. Oh, okay. I, I don't see yeah. how we can get away from oh, that, okay. actually. Okay. Um, Although it would be nice not to, to have other ways to engage with people, maybe people that we don't usually connect with, uh, to get them involved. Sometimes public meetings are not the most right. conducive to constructive ideas and topics. Right. Well, it's people yeah. Saying the same thing. It's mostly you know people feeling like they had a chance to voice their their issues, and so um, it can certainly be a combination. We can have a website. We can have a page open so people come to the public meeting and they can just add in while they're listening. 
they don't even have to participate. But I think we're going to have to, I mean, judging how active the public participation was in the last master plan, I think we need to really seriously think about that. Yeah. No, we definitely will need a lot of public input. Um, I think all we're trying to do, or that I was trying to do with this one, is to try to go and focus the public input at a different step in the process. Mm -hmm. In 2009, you know, the, the world is your oyster. What, what would you like? And the public came in with a lot of ideas. And that, that's good, that's healthy, that's helpful, but when we then turn around and go and say, hi, Energy Committee, here's your energy plan, and they look mm -hmm. at it and go and say, but we weren't involved, consulted, worked on this, this. This may seem like great ideas to the public, but those of us who work in the industry yeah. see that there are better ways of doing it. So we're trying to just kind of turn the tables a little bit and start with the energy committees and develop a plan and then kind of take that to the public and go and say, this is, this is where we would like to go. And if the public says they don't like it, then we've got to go back to the energy committees, the okay. transportation yeah. committees. Maybe we could also say to the public now who are interested in being, in being involved, why don't you work through a committee? I mean, they could offer commentary to the committees, and then that might, you know, facilitate your process. Because I agree, it would it would be a lot more workable to work through the committees rather than just having it as an open, wide open um, process. That that was challenging. All six hundred people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think what, once we get through some of these goals that the committees have, we can start to put it to the public and, and put together a survey that asks, you know, is this something that you see as an important aspect of Montpelier? Or, I don't know. We don't, crafting survey questions is challenging, but I'm thinking that with that content, we can, we would be a better equipped to craft survey right. questions than we and were previously. Then the public could come out with you know, oh yeah, those are important, or they could even rank them, I suppose. But they could also add more um, um, issues that maybe the committees haven't considered. So, yeah. I think it's certainly and if we have the hub stuff come through, yeah, I'm hoping a nice opportunity. the hub would be a good opportunity. Uh, oh. Yeah, okay. so, yeah. If we get that grant. Yeah. 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 Are we going to have a high school student joining us? I was just thinking about that, you know, engaging the youth. Is that pending? I, I haven't heard anything. On the planning commission? heard anything either. No, I mean, we, no we, one is interested. I, I, did, did, the, I, did, I did the survey. I mean, well, oh, okay. high school hasn't started back yet. Oh, okay. So it'll, um, if it follows the elementary school, it'll be this Wednesday. It'll be the okay. first day. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Maybe a month from now, we'll, yeah, we'll hear about that. I mean, we could specifically reach out to the schools rather than just one particular person. And maybe they could have their own survey determining what students feel is important about the city. She's talking about um, when, when the, yeah, when the high school, because the high school had reached out to, to all of the city. And so we did the survey. And then, so I, I think that there will be a student from some class or program they're doing like be assigned to us and start showing up at our meetings. Uh, yeah, this. but I, yeah. Yeah, I was sort of thinking just in general about engaging. Yeah, yeah engaging them. Yeah, schools. Yeah, it seems like it. But. So it sounds like for the next meeting, in advance of the next meeting, John is going to put together some templates or some sort of mechanism for us to input some content. Barb's going to work with, I think Stephanie will probably want to, but I think, I think engaging with, with Barb on behalf of the committee, energy committee, Laura Gebhardt, um, who has some experience with this, uh, Stephanie, and then I will try to dig up all of the various links that I've been sent for the basic repository of the committee. <laughs> my job here um, so we have something to review for the next meeting and see how that seems to be working and 
So that'll be our pilot folders. So I think folders for a couple of committees and then the general resources tab or whatever would be a good, pla a good place to start. Um, I think that's a good good step. I, I just I want to make sure we keep moving forward, but I don't think we need to be at a very crazy clip or anything. I, I don't think the committees would be able to keep up if we did, and maybe, maybe they would. I don't know, but um, but I want to make sure we keep our momentum going. So. I was impressed with how many committees came given the pretty short notice. Yeah, yeah I was very impressed. They jumped right in. Yeah. So that was great. Yeah, and I think, Mike, you and I need to compare the list that we have and make sure we've got all of the additions that have been added since. The additional committees, you mean? Yeah. Okay. I think we had, Donna Bate mentioned that she, her, she believed there were more committees. Than so we need to identify if we haven't heard from anybody. We need to make sure our list is comprehensive as well. So I think there's two Yeah, we know the school. We know we heard from the school board. Mary Hooper in her email Mary, talked yeah. about the fact that we should, could have included the school board and maybe we should get them for the next time. Yeah, so I think if, if we, my, if you and I can figure out who we haven't heard from and who are the suggested additional committees that we have or haven't heard from, we make sure we just have a comprehensive list of everybody that we're engaging with. Um, and Jamie Grenfeld sent us the email list that my my letter went to, mm -hmm. but I wasn't able to open up the contacts on that. I don't oh. know if you were. No, I had her send them individually to me because of that. Okay. It was just the list of committees or groups that she had contacted. They yeah, the the data that she sent us just wasn't, it didn't, I, I don't know, it yeah. must have been a, a software issue. So, okay. So I, I tried a lot of things, but I was, it defeated me. <laughs> I tried it. My Luddite yeah. ways. Thought, oh, okay. Well, yeah. Very hot link you couldn't find, huh. you know, it's really so, a challenge. It was an Outlook thing, so I used Outlook to open it, and I also downloaded some things to try to open it. No, nothing worked. Huh. So anyway, okay, so I think that's that's something we need to do. And I think we need to maybe create a list to be posted on our website of all the committees that we're collaborating with. Uh, so that will be my task in conjunction with Mike and Kirby, who apparently has all their contact information. <laughs> well, you can... You, oh, I, you were copied I was, on okay. the thing I sent out, so look, yeah. look there for the all. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. Okay. All right. So we do have time to move on to zoning, our zoning punch list. So that's item six on the agenda. Um, I don't know that everybody has their copy with them. I can share mine, um, but Mark and Mike and Barb can also share yep. with Mine. your neighbor. Um, we know what number we <laughs> We were on, uh, we've got a, uh, we've kind of we jumped picked around. a few, but 28 would be the next one on the list. Oh, and okay. I did color code the most recent one. You've got an older one. Is this the most recent one? The most recent one has color, yes. Oh. Yeah, this, that's right. This is the one that has my comments, but let's look at this. So you haven't changed any numbers on the color. I don't no, he did. I thought he did. Yeah, there might be some yeah. changes. All right. Well, I've I'm, tried to I've tried to add them now only to the end, so it yeah. doesn't mess with everybody's That's numbers. So before the color, I think you inserted them in. Yeah, I did, as I got new ones. Um, but it, on the left hand side, if they're green, those were the ones that I assume didn't need to be talked about or not talked about too much. And yellows were the ones that I at least need to mention that there's something of concern to be talked about. So 26 on the colored one. 26 and 27 were the last two that we finished. Did we do frontage build out? Yes. Oh. 
PC agrees, delete figure 3-03. So yeah, there must be one, another one later than that one. Uh oh. Colored version? But I'll I'll print out new ones for the next meeting. But okay. the next one I had was figure three dash oh seven remove parking areas as accessory structures. Um, but I don't know if we want to talk about the green ones or if we want to just jump to the yellow ones. Well, are we going to have to talk about the green ones at some point? Well, we were just no. going to do them as consent because they're mostly smaller. Uh, Unless issues. you identify the concern, Barb. Well. Kim's notes. I have Kim's notes in front of me, and he, well, his might be outdated too, actually, huh? Yeah. This is dated the Why 20, were July 22nd. Why were parking areas... Accessory structures anyway. Well, that was why it's being removed. It's because they showed up they, as accessory structures and therefore had to start meeting all of the setback requirements of accessory structures. And that was a glitch. That okay. was a glitch. So I was right. just saying remove it. Okay. Next one. Okay. So. Are we jumping to thirty, or are we gonna? Go yeah, to I mean. One? I'm in favor of just doing it by consent, and then I mean this isn't the this is the last opportunity by any means. Next time we look at these, yeah, if there's one that we already apples. passed over, we can revisit. Okay, so item 30. Well, yeah, I mean that's the thing is I. I looked at that one. So the issue with number 30. So this is talking about demolition of historic structures is. In one sentence under applicability, it says anything that is on the state and national register, while under D2, it says something is either on the state or national register. And that's not as big of an issue as, um, additionally, the current practice has not been either of these, but rather it is applied only to the contributing structures within the national register district. So what this is talking about is who needs to, the demolition, which, de, which historic structures that are being proposed to be demolished need to go through this review process. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's the big question because the way the current rules are written, we've got some issues in that I don't have a database. I have a database for everything within the National Dis Register District. I have a map color-coded which ones are contributing, which ones are not contributing. But that's only for the National Register District, which is also historically what was only being regulated. The way this is worded, things that are on the state list that are outside the Register District would now also need to be, and I don't have map showing this. That are outside the district. Yes. So and the owner has to go through some active process to be put on the state list? Nope. They're already on the state list. The state has surveyed. Um, but it's in big brown books on the shelf. Um, so it's not online like the National Register listing is? It, it It's, I mean, there's a PDF online, yes. But it's We've got the historic district, but the question will start coming up. The question basically is going to come up for other buildings. We need to then evaluate which ones are historic, which ones are on the register, and what, well, which ones do we want to apply the, the rules to? So the question is about the Vermont. Yeah. Give, give us give us historic a set of sites. rules that you want to enforce. If you want to enforce this town wide, any historic building town wide, then that just means I'll have to put together the resources to, to do that from a map. Is it eligible or is there contributing? A little confused the status reads. Is that's a good question whether it says eligible for 
or whether it says is on the state register because if it's eligible that gets to another completely different level it says on the 3004 yeah it says on the vermont historic sites and structure survey and the national register and? Yeah. yeah well that one says and and then okay. then we get 3004 um so if you're looking on page 3-9 on your book, under demolition it says um, and, but on 3-10 number 2 it says or. So we should be consistent as to whether we mean and the list or or the list. And how did the Vermont Historic Sites and Structures Survey get added to this? I guess we, I thought we were always talking about the National Register, and so um, I don't remember discussing the Vermont Historic Site Survey. Where did it come from? It's. I think some of this was added. Some of this is this is in three o four. So this is stuff Brandy added. Yeah. We were but some of this was taken from the old, some of, I think some of the standards are taken from the old zoning and pulled forward. So I think we just had a little bit of inconsistency because I know in practice, that's why Cedar Street was able to be demolished without meeting demolition standards. It was a historic structure and it was demolished. And I think there was one over on North Street that was also demolished. Because they were out of the district? Because they were out of the National Register District. So they didn't have to meet these standards. But under the new zoning, it kind of is written as if they now would need to go through. Because they are listed. Because they're listed but in not the necessarily state. necessarily in the district. Yeah. And so we don't have maps for them. And the question was really okay, let's take a step back and just decide what's our policy. Do we just really care about demolition of historic structures within the historic district, which is the cleanest, easiest for us to enforce because we've got the maps for it, or do we want to have something bigger than that? Well, what's been the, aren't we, aren't we going with sort of existing practice until we re sort of revise everything? Yes, except that that's not what's actually written in the rules, and that was the issue. Is now that we're revised, now that we're doing a cleanup, this this is mostly supposed to be trying to do some of our cleanups, and that came up in our cleanup list was, hey, wait, we've got two issues. One is it now appears that we're enforcing demolition town wide, not just in the historic district. And two. We've got this and or thing where it talks about and in one section and or in the other, and we really should be consistent there as well. Yeah, that one is easier to clean up. That's easier to clean the, up. Yeah. I just need to know what we're. Is this something that the Historic Commission, Preservation Commission, is going to want to weigh in on? We could certainly get their their input. I mean, if we just do something now, they may bristle at not having been consulted. So I'll just put a note, get HPC input at this point? Sure. And then move on. All right. Um, so if we skip to 31, this is talking about riparian areas. Oh yeah, buried streams. And buried streams, we now have have uh, two of them. So for anyone who wants to just look at what we're talking about, this is this is Berry Street, and this is Wheelock. So I mean, you'll notice there's just a stream that that has for decades been buried. Big culvert. In a big culvert. But the issue is we have stream water setback and yeah. buffer requirements that now apply to people's backyards because there's a culvert yeah. running through their backyard and we just need to go and revise that. There was also an application over on Route 302 
um, well, I'll say a couple weeks ago now because I've been out for a little bit, but it's another one where there's a culvert that goes under their parking lot. And the question was, are we applying a water setback to that parking lot? And do they, you know, there's vegetation requirements or all these requirements, except it's a paved parking lot that this culverted stream runs through. Um, so we haven't handled this one before. I know we've talked about it before. I think we talked about that one yeah. before, but we we just mentioned it. We're I think I mentioned it as a. just discovering them all over town now. Yeah. yeah. This is yeah. what's happening. Water's going to start. Yeah. Seems reasonable. So yeah. the the thing that comes up is. Okay, I think you've got your... We can map it, or we can... I can come up with a process for... If it's in a culvert. If, it, if it's in a culvert, these are the rules to apply. Yeah, I think that is yeah. probably the best Pointer. thing to do. I'll draft some rules. All right. 33... Already done 32, right? 32 is already done. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. 30. One note on 32 is that Kim, Kim had a note, which is criteria for DRV waivers should be stated, which is what John Adams mentioned, too, which is uh, to the extent that we're going to allow for building on steep slopes, we should probably give some specific criteria of yep. what will be acceptable. So I think having more detail about what the engineering plan should entail may accomplish that, but we'll probably just need to discuss that a little bit more. Yeah. Well, at least at this point, I've got a, a framework that I can start putting things together and writing. A lot of, a number of these yellow ones, I need to draft language for, but I didn't want to draft language until I kind of knew. Yep. And I think that's the same for 32. Now that yep. I know what we want to do, I can draft up some language and we can do some wordsmithing. Okay. Is, that, is that one where you could borrow from somewhere? Like, seems like we wouldn't be the only city that would allow building on slopes, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. To get an idea of what other cities of concerns were. It's all writing zoning ordinances. It's just kind of pasting from other zoning ordinances. <laughs> I think so. You don't, yeah, no. All right, so number 33. So, yeah, these 33s that, um, 308 B, I think that's slopes. Yeah. Erosion control. Erosion control. Um, applicability, uh, the first sentence is not applicability. It's either purpose, move it up, or some kind of performance standard, move it down. Considering the intent of the, of the statement is generally captured already in C1, I would just strike it. Um, 34 also is in 3008, inconsistency in how slope is broken down. Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. minute. Let's stay with 33 oh, okay. before we move on, because I um, just want to make sure anybody who wants to comment on it has a chance. So all you're suggesting is to strike the first sentence under applicability? It's a long 308.B. Yep. Ends with natural resources. Is that what you're proposing, Mike? Yes. And then, so that 3008.B would begin the provisions of this section apply? Yep. Okay. That's actually the applicability. I mean, that sentence is actually a requirement. Well, in which case, well, the the three zero zero eight point B. Yeah. Is talking about applicability. What needs to meet erosion control? The I know. The first sentence is a requirement. A standard. So either we so have to move it down. I don't think we should strike a requirement without talking about it. So, the requirement is all construction activities that will disturb soil shall implement appropriate measures to prevent erosion and sedimentation from adversely impacting nearby properties, public infrastructure, or downstream water bodies. 
and then in parentheses it says for further guidance see Vermont Agency of Natural Resources low risk site handbook for erosion prevention and sediment control so yeah I agree this doesn't belong in applicability but I don't know if we want to strike it all together maybe what we want to do is it's not purpose either is it I mean no but the section C, C says you shall submit and implement a professionally prepared erosion control plan in accordance with Vermont right. standards and specifications. Of the All right, so it does account. Okay, yes. Control. Okay, yes. So let's just strike it. It's accomplished down there. It just seems redundant. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. Just wanted to make sure. Yep. Um, I actually have to leave right at 7:30. So. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, that's a good cue for us to wrap up anyway. Um, go ahead if you need to go. Okay. Um, right. Thanks. So we're going to keep going through this at the next meeting, but we are um, we're going to consider everything in green to be a consent item. Yellow will go through. I think that probably makes good sense. Yeah, um, and Mike will circulate an updated version to us because we run out of coloring at 37. Did we already handle 34? About the 30% or more? No. Or more than 30%? No. We'll do that at the next meeting. Okay, it's green though. Yeah. So. Oh, I mean, it's, a, it's pretty much a non... It's just a matter of, we talk about, sometimes we talk about 30% or more, and sometimes we talk about more than 30 percent so with the green I mean, if you do have a concern we'll take it up yeah but it's they're considered approved unless somebody raises a concern but so. he's not making a proposal on that one that's all um okay because you said you're going to research it well i would make it consistent with what's on the map oh okay all right yeah the, the question is did the map is the map showing me what is more than 30 percent or is the map showing me what is 30 percent or more and which and map? more so i mean it's it's the which no it's mm. it makes a difference right <laughs> okay map are you talking we'll, come, about? we'll yeah. come back we'll come back okay so item six is considered minutes from august 13th we don't have we any don't have so any. we're not going to address that this this week um an item or that's item seven. So item eight as adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Do I have second? Second. John. John. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye.